We resume this morning with our survey of the Old Testament. I did not finish last week, um, last time. Uh, if you if you remember, we started looking. Um, that's not where I was. Um, just find my place. There you go. We started looking at um, how the Old Testament sets up for the New Testament. I'm gonna um, have to tell Lyle where I am since he's jumping around in the uh, PowerPoint uh, to catch up with me. So the next slide will be the following, which is 14, and then we'll just move on from there. Uh, I know that our bulletin says we're starting with Genesis this morning, um, but I didn't finish, and so I wanted to uh, just finish where I left off, and then we'll walk into Genesis, which I don't think we'll finish this morning as well, but hopefully next week we'll be caught up with um, both Genesis and uh, Exodus. Um, so I intended to do a lot more by adding in <clears throat> some background, but hopefully what I'll do is add in the necessary ba background as we move on um, through each book instead of doing an entire um, Old Testament overview in the beginning. I just thought, let me lay the foundation for how the New Testament is built off the Old Testament. One of the fundamental errors that you find in Old Testament um, uh, studies is that the New Testament reinterprets the Old Testament. That is not a proper way to interpret the Old Testament. You want to work from the Old Testament forward. Now, there are significant passages that give us more insight in the Old Testament. New Testament passages provide a lot more insight for um, the Old Testament, but it's never reinterpreted to mean something different. <clears throat> so we started by looking at the intertextuality of the Old Testament. I'm not going to repeat that. Um, but I'm just going to resume where I ended, which was actually over here. The inter-theological connections of the Old Testament. Everything in the Old Testament is theological. We, we often forget that, that it's not just a location. It is not just a list of names. There's meaning and significance in it. Genealogies. Who loves reading genealogies? I bet that half of us just skip over chapter 5. Man, it's just a list of names. Why on earth? I'm going to mention it now, but when I get to it in the Genesis section, it should make a lot of more sense. Genealogies are designed to narrow down the promised line of the seed. That is foundational. The reason we have it is not just to give us a list of king, names of the kings, a list of the names of the sons of Adam. It has one focus, one goal, and it is to tell us that there is an expected seed and it's not found here, it's not found here, it's not found here. So genealogies, can I draw on the screen? I hope I don't mess it up. Let me, let me see. Can I draw? So genealogies... Can you see that? That's, that's a bad color. Uh, can I change the color? Uh, let's see if I can do that. Yeah. Okay, that, I don't like that. That looks like a highlighter. Uh, that is a highlighter. Okay, there you go. Abraham. Um, Jesus. <coughs> Matthew. I'm going to start, actually, you know what? I can't erase that. I should have had Adam over there. <clears throat> and then the line keeps on going down. The whole purpose of genealogies is to point to, ge those are arrows. <laughs> it looks like something. <laughs> the whole point of genealogies is to say how God is taking the scope of humanity and narrowing it down um, to Jesus Christ. And so we'll get to that in um, the genealogies. But look at chapter 5 of Genesis. <clears throat> so there's going to be a little bit of repetition since I'm mentioning this year. We will get back to it later on. Look at chapter 5. Notice verse 1, and this is the book of generations, of the generations of Adam. 
Look down at verse 5. Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Verse 8. Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. 11. Thus all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. You get the point, right? Everybody dies. Genesis 5 is called the graveyard of the Old Testament. Everyone dies. Why do you think that is? It's to show the seed has not come yet. It's not this one. It's not this one. It's not this one. All of them died. There is significance in that, but I'm going to put a pin in it until I get to it in Genesis chapter 5. So the whole point of genealogy is to show that there's an expected seed that is to come. Where do we get that from? Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, speaking to the serpent, and Eve. Between your offspring, that is the offspring of the serpent, and her offspring. He, the offspring of the woman, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. I know that there are different translations that says, and he shall crush your head, which is probably a better translation, and he shall bruise your heel. In this there is a prophecy that there will be one from a woman who will come and conquer you. Um, I was listening to a OT survey guy that I sent to Peter, Don, and Frank. And uh, interestingly, in Genesis, he says that God conquers the enemy through the church. Oh, wait, no. It is Jesus that will conquer the enemy. It is he that shall bruise his head. Not the church. Jesus doesn't reign through the church. He will reign, period. Whether the church exists or not, he will reign. So every genealogy works out to demonstrate this promise. The seed is coming. So the messianic line stems from Genesis 3.15. And God's plan is is to show that this promise will be fulfilled in the time to come. That's why we have genealogies. We have another genealogy which is found in Matthew. We'll look at that later, which is probably the final genealogy in the list uh, in the list in the Bible, demonstrating that what God has promised has been fulfilled. What is the theological significance of, theology, uh, of genealogies. It proves God's faithfulness. I've promised and I've fulfilled my promise. Consider this. Throughout the generations, throughout every history of humanity, God had a single goal to bring about the seed of the woman. God shows that I am the God who is faithful to my promise. And that will be significant as history moves on. Sorry. Just mute my. Not only does genealogies have theology, but also narrative in the Bible whether old or new, has tremendous significance. Go to Psalm 106. Often we read narrative as merely just a story. We read geography as merely just a location. But both history through narrative has theology. In other words, narrative communicates theology. Therefore, locations have theology connected to it. For instance, the wilderness. Why is the wilderness significant? 
Notice what Psalm 106 says. Praise Yahweh, or give thanks to Yahweh, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. If you know anything about Psalms, by now you should know this. The first line tells you what? That what the psalm is about. The second line clarifies what the psalm is about. Who can utter the mighty deeds of Yahweh or declare all his praise? Pray, blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Now, notice what he says in verse 6. Both we and our fathers have sinned and have committed iniquity. Stop it. Um, have committed iniquity. We have done wickedness. Well, when? Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works, implication, in Egypt. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love that you remembered them, but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. Where are we heading now? Into the wilderness. This is Exodus. You saved them for your name's sake that he might make known his power. Sorry, he saved them for his name's sake, that he may make known his power. He rebuked the sea, and it became dry, and he led them through a deep, through the deep as though a desert. He saved them from the hand of the foe, probably the Egyptians, and he redeemed them from the power of the enemy. And the waters covered the, their adversaries. Not one of them were left. Interestingly, a couple of weeks ago, I read that they found a dead army in the Red Sea. Huh. Oh, yeah, they did. Because it happened. It's history. They soon forgot his works, and they did not wait for his counsel. But they had craved a wanton craving in the wilderness and put God to the test in the desert. They were in the wilderness. The wilderness has theological significance for Israel. Look at verse 19. They made a calf at Horeb and worshipped a metal image and they exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. Does that sound familiar? Yes, not only Exodus, but where else do you see it? In Romans chapter 1, exchange the glory of God for that which is made in the image, uh, or the, the image of God. They forgot God, the Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. In other words, all history has theology when it comes to Israel. Everything that God did for them demonstrated a quality about God. It spoke, and yet they forgot their God. This psalm recalls the history of Israel, especially the wilderness wanderings, and yet despite the rejection and failure before God, He remains faithful. So the, the psalmists, Psalmist here recalls the faithfulness of God despite the failure of the people. How do I know that? Look at verse 1 again. Oh, give thanks to Yahweh for his good, for his what? He has said love, his covenant love, his faithful love, his ongoing, unfailing love endures forever. The psalm is about the faithfulness of God despite the failure of the people. Now you, you should see that. When you read Old Testament um, narrative, it speaks about God and not just about the failure of the people. Despite their failure, God remains faithful. So the Old Testament shows us the faithfulness of God in the wilderness. So who else was in the wilderness? You think of anyone else that was in the wilderness? Go to Psalm 63. <clears throat> 
Notice I am not reading the narrative to show that narrative has theology. I'm reading the Psalms, whose poetical, which is poetical by nature, but recalling the history of Israel. And here we have a historical account of David. Notice what it says. And David, a Psalm of David, verse 1, when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Notice what he says. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. Why would he be thirsty? My flesh faints for you in a dry and a weary land where there is no water. David equates his wilderness experience to the parched, yearning desire of his soul. Yes, David was in the wilderness as well. Look at, I think it's Psalm 16. <clears throat> um, I think it's this one. Yep. <clears throat> A victim of David, probably a song or a liturgical psalm of David. We don't know what that word really means, the uh, word victim. Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I say to Yahweh, you are my God, and I have no good apart from you. Where's David when he writes this? He's in the wilderness. He's not with his people. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is my delight. David knows what it feels to yearn after God, to be apart from the people of God, and he says, you are my refuge. You are the one that I flee to in this wilderness. David here in this context, as in many of the Psalms, is fleeing from Saul. You can read that in 1 Samuel 21. David was tested in the wilderness. Remember when he um, ate the bread? Was he supposed to? Not. No. Remember when David lied in the wilderness? About his men? David suffered in the wilderness. Who else was in the wilderness? We have Israel. We have David and Matthew chapter 4. Jesus was driven into the wilderness. The same region that both Israel and David was in, Jesus goes to as well. Why? In order for the king to sympathize with his people, the king needs to suffer like his people. In order for the king to be a sympathetic high priest, the king needs to suffer like his people. David goes into the wilderness, but the greatest son of David also goes into the wilderness. And here's the significance. Where Israel failed, Jesus conquered. Where David failed, Jesus reigned victoriously. I thought I put the sound off. Clearly not. That's brightness. Just a reminder that I'm actually preaching today. Any questions? Okay, let's move on. Don't know if you can see that. Um, Numbers 10, 12. And the children of Israel took their journey out of the wilderness of Sinai. And the cloud rested in the wilderness of Paran. And this is the wilderness of uh, Paran where they rested. Um, there's a huge intertextual connection. Don't just read wilderness. 
make the connections. Go find everywhere else where the word wilderness is being used because oftentimes it is the same region or area where they are. Uh, it's a dry and a barren land. It's a very harsh environment. Yet God remains faithful to a grumbling people. You can see why they grumbled. I think I have another photo. Um, earnestly I seek you. And my flesh faints for you as in a dry and in a weary land. Uh, that looked like Paul. I mean, yeah, how do, you, how do you survive? And that's the whole point. You leave people out here in the desert for 40 years. What's going to happen to them? They'll become prunes. They'll die out of starvation and hunger and thirst. But God preserves. God's faithfulness is shown in the wilderness experience, which is what David himself experiences as well. Not only is the wilderness a significant point, but also the Mount of Olives. We see this as a significant um, place in all of Israel, there's a weighty theological um, significance behind this. Mount of Olives lies east of Jerusalem. And I know that Robert was there. I don't think anyone else here had the privilege of going to visit um, Israel. But um, if you look in, I don't know if I have it in this. No, I don't have it yet. If you look in maps of the um, old Israel, <coughs> That terrain still looks the same today. You have Mount of Olives, which lie east of Jerusalem. Why is the Mount of Olives significant? Well, for a number of reasons. It was also known, in one map I found this word, the Mountain of Defeat. The Mountain of Shame. This is where horrendous deeds were committed by Israel by Solomon, by those who offered to pagan gods, to Baal. Sacrifices were made on this mount. The killing of infants were made on this mount. The kings, when they fled from Jerusalem, the kings of Judah, they fled past this mount. The last king of Judah, I believe his Jewish name was Jeconiah, and he was renamed by king of Babylon as Zedekiah. The last king of Judah does not walk victoriously into Jerusalem. When the Babylonians came, he took his stuff and he fled. It says, past the Jordan. This is east of Jerusalem, which is by the foot of the Mount of Olives. Hmm. Interesting. Go to Zechariah chapter 14. <clears throat> when the Babylonians came in, 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles chapter 36. You should know that, right? Because you've read through the Old Testament. So, uh, 2 Kings 25 and 2 Chronicles 36. Chronicle the invasion of King of Babylon, ba Babylonia into Jerusalem. They are about to sack Jerusalem, to burn it to the ground. Zechariah does not want to submit and he rebels, and in, in that rebellion, he flees for his life. Notice what it says in chapter 14, verse 1. And behold, the day is coming for Yahweh, when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. What is he thinking about? An invasion. When the spoils of Israel, which belonged to them, was taken from them. 
hang on, a day is coming when that will be reversed. For I, this is Yahweh, will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city shall be taken and the houses plundered and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then Yahweh will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. Hang on. Yahweh will go out and fight against the nations? Oftentimes when this is read by certain groups of people, they will say, this has happened. It's taken place. They went out. They were already in exile. This is not that. Because look at the next line, verse 3. And Yahweh will go out and fight against, against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. This is a very specific day. On that day. His feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. Wait a minute. Show me that day in history. And I will change my eschatology. Show me this day in history where Yahweh came to the Mount of Olives and put his foot on the Mount of Olives while fighting the nations. Hasn't happened. Hasn't happened because it hasn't happened. Notice what takes place to the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two. From the east to the west by a wide valley. So that half the mount shall move northward and the other southward. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountain from the valley of the mountains. Shall, uh, uh, for the valley of the mountains shall reach Azal. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the day of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then Yahweh, my God, will come and all the holy ones with him. Has this happened? No. Look down at verse 9. And Yahweh will be what? King. See the theology. Lost king of Judah fled past the Mount of Olives. The true king of Judah will come to the Mount of Olives and destroy the mountain of defeat, destroy the mountain of shame and say, here I am. The true king is coming and he will be king over all the earth. On that day, Yahweh will be one and his name one. Some people st struggle over this. They say, well, the Trinity is going to become one. Uh, no. What God is saying is that there will be no other competing gods. I will crush every pagan religion. There's going to be one God that will be worshipped around the globe. That day has not happened yet. There's not going to be another name that people will call on. There will be one name. There will be one God that will be worshipped globally. Saints, this day has not happened. Why? Because the Mount of Olives still stands. Geography has theology. Take note of how God demonstrates the significance of theology. I think the disciples understood this. They are often blamed, go to Matthew 24, often blamed for having a wrong understanding of Old Testament theology. But there was something that they got. It is that the king, the true king, will reign over his people. Jesus left the temple. And going, uh, and as, and, and was going away, when his disciples came to point to him the building of the temple. And he answered, You see all these? Do you not? Truly I say to you, they will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. What is Jesus saying? He's prophesying. The destruction of Jerusalem. That is AD 70. Took place. He leaves Jerusalem. Where does he go to? Mount of Olives. 
and he sat on the Mount of Olives. Ah, that is awfully familiar. Last king of Judah left Jerusalem, fled past the Mount of Olives. Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives, and then he says this to them. The disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things will be, the, the, the things that relate to the kingdom. Because here's the temple, you're on the Mount of Olives, hang on. Don't we have theology to tell us that when the king comes, that he will reign over all the earth? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? When are we expecting the kingdom to be established? Jesus speaks about how false signs will precede that time. How uh, not only will the temple be destroyed, but there will be an abomination in the temple. There will be a man, verse 15, See when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel standing in the holy place. So not only is it going to be destroyed, it's going to be erected again. Because in that day when it is erected, there's going to be abomination in the temple. When you see all these things, verse 20, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. This is written to the Jews, not to the church. For then there will be a great tribulation. That is to the Jews and not to the church, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, that is in that day, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human will be saved. But for the sake of the elect, not the church, but for Israel. Those days will be cut short. How do I know this relates to Israel? Because of all the Jewishness that is found in here. The Sabbath, the temple, the Christ, the false Christ, and the false prophets all relate to a deception that will take place in Jerusalem to God's people. Notice what it says in verse 29. Immediately after those days, the tribulation, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Show me this day. It hasn't taken place yet. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will come. Uh, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, uh, of the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. That is Zechariah chapter 14. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet and call, and they will, uh, they will gather his elect from the four, end, uh, from four winds and from the ends of heaven to the other. <clears throat> what a day that will be. That has not happened yet. There's tremendous significance in geography. Okay, I'm going to have to move on. I will not cover the next two. Um, Jordan River. Okay, maybe I'll mention this one. Jordan River, why is it significant? Anybody think why the Jordan River is important? Where was... Elijah lost sin. Well, the answer should be pretty obvious. At the Jordan River. Where was John the Baptist's first ministry? At the Jordan River. What is Elijah called? What is John called? What do they ask him? Are you Elijah? Are you the promised one that will come before the Messiah? There's significance in that. Why do we skip over those connections when it's made for us in scriptures? John the Baptist fulfills the prophecy that there will be one who will be like Elijah. Jesus calls him that one. The Dead Sea, I'll just mention this. This is the place that was destroyed, the area around it. Um, in the condemnation of Sodom and Gomorrah. The effect of that is felt in the Dead Sea, in that nothing can live in it but a few algae. And then they say, well, no, there's life. There's nothing. There's no fish. There's nothing in the Dead Sea. Ask um, Robert. He's been there. 
The Dead Sea is known as the Dead Sea for a reason. It is dead. Ezekiel 47 says, The water will flow from Jerusalem and will cleanse the Dead Sea. It speaks about the renewal. There's a day coming where the Dead Sea will no longer be under judgment. It will no longer point to judgment, but to renewal. There is something that's going to happen in the future that will cause the Dead Sea no longer to be dead. That day has not happened yet. Therefore, we cannot be in the eschaton. We cannot be in the time where Jesus reigns. We cannot be in a period where the king is over the earth and reigning because the renewal has not yet taken place. Okay, now I'll move on. Questions, answers before we move on to Genesis. Questions, not answers, questions or comments. Anything you've learned in... um, your maybe background reading or anything thus far in the Old Testament that stood out to you, if it's going to cover what I'm going to cover, then I will just, I will, I will pause you. Nothing? Okay, well, keep reading. Hopefully, this will help. I need to exit. So let me close that. Um, Genesis, there we go. Oh, that's not good. <coughs> All right. What do you see? Um, it's not what I wanted to do. There you go. What is my time? Is that ten to a quarter to? <laughs> That's not good. Um. Right, so I was planning to do that, uh, overview, contents, and then just a walkthrough through the book of Genesis. Uh, I will let Frank do this next time, so (laughs) I'm just joking. I know you can't see that, so maybe I can zoom in. Okay, that's good, that's good, that's good. Um, You may not be uh, somebody that likes geography. I encourage you to pick up map books, Bible map books. And um, try to give attention to them because they do provide you a little bit of deeper understanding of what's taking place. Um, it, the Okay, so I will have to change my color now and I will do that. The history of Israel takes place in that area. It's quite a big area. Notice you've got Saudi Arabia down here. You've got Kuwait. These are modern names. Iraq. Um, Iran is over there. Uh, Lebanon did not exist. So we'll just take it off there. It's a modern name. It is Israel. It belongs to Israel. It's always been Israel's. Um, In order for the Egyptians, Africa to move um, to Europe, to move over to this area over here, that's an arrow, they have to pass through Israel. Um, This area over up till that, um, okay, that um, weird looking thing, is known as the Fertile Crescent. And the reason is because of both the Nile and these two rivers over here, Tigris and um, the Euphrates River. It provides a lot of bountiful uh, nutritional land, and so it's known as the Fertile Crescent. So coming back to, how, how do I delete that? How do you, re- okay, there you go. That's not that. It ain't working. Okay, so let me let me say this. In order for um, the Egyptians, the the uh, Africans, to move up into Israel or to fight with anyone coming from that side, they would have to go through Israel. 
in any, anyone coming from this side, whether it's the Europeans or the Iraqians, in order for them to, to fight, they met in a valley, which is around about there, known as what? Megiddo. Also known as? Revelation? Of what? Armageddon. Same valley, which has significance in eschatology, the place where there will be wars. Um, this was known, there are trade routes down here, um, which goes that way and that way, and there were trade routes uh, past um, uh, on the outside of, of uh, Israel proper, uh, Jerusalem. Uh, but for the most part, this indicated a trade route, but also a war route. This area is hyped with travel, it's significant on a number of levels, and that's why Israel is so central to it. Significant not only in theology, but significant in history. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'll give you the five major um, elements to memorize for the course next week, and then um, uh, we, will, we will pause it there. First thing is the key word. It's beginning or beginnings. Make sure you know that. Because I will ask people next week, what is the key word? The key theme, it's generally promise, or if you're covenantal, it will be covenant. Um, and if you um, uh, dispensational, it's covenant and seed. But I like to think of all three of them as being uh, one of the, some of the main uh, themes. So remember all three of them, promise, seed, and covenant. Uh, who's done Old Testament survey before? Let me see. That guy, that guy, and Peter. Okay. Who are the four key people? Not those four. Who are the four key people? Because that's five. I think two, four, five, yes. Generally, there's normally in OT survey four key people. They are? Sorry? Adam? Did you, no, no, not Adam. Yes? No? No? Abraham? Isaac? Jacob and Joseph? There's generally the four key people in um, your OT surveys. What happened to Abraham? The father of the nation is not even in the four key people. What happened to Adam? The father of all people is not even in the list. You could probably add nowhere in there. But the key people is God, Adam, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you'll see that when we get to the genealogies. So you've got... Key word, beginning, key, prom, uh, key theme, promise, seed, and covenant. Key people, God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, author, there's no dispute in my mind that Moses wrote, wrote it because he says so at the end of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 28, um, that he wrote this with his own hand. And Jesus says the book of Moses, um, the, the, the law that Moses wrote. So he wrote it after the Exodus, sometime after the Exodus, obviously, uh, uh, but before his death, which is in 1405. I don't know why I repeated that. Um, all right, so I'm going to end over there. Any questions or comments? Yes. New Testament, I'm sorry, thanks. So just a general question. We know when we're approaching New Testament, we think that the key, one of the key aspects is authorial intent. And in the letters, it's normally quite clearly outlined. But in the yeah, Old Testament, to me, it seems less clear authorial intent. And also um, the sort of historical perspective for the New Testament, a lot of that we derive from the Old and the other books of the new, but... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm you're struggling not to follow, yeah, yeah, what you mean. Um, Maybe we can chat later. Are, are you <laughs> saying that it doesn't seem like authorial intent is a major factor in the writings of the Old Testament? I, I suppose I find it less easy to see 
so what the purpose is. With the New Testament, often it will say, I am writing this to oh, you so that, sure. whereas Moses does On a few occasions, yeah. yeah. Um, so with narrative, generally the major theme or the major reason for writing is, um, is derivative. Um, obviously, he wants obedience from his people, but let me ask, not you, but anybody, why, why do we have progressive revelation in the Old Testament? Why does God not give everything in Genesis? Why is it progressively revealed over, what's it, 2,000 years? Um, of 1,400 years of writing? Anyone? Suggestions? If nobody, uh, Cameron, what do you think? Yeah, no, you were looking very... <laughs> okay, take it to Hilton then. <laughs> Since you have an answer. No, I don't have an answer. Wow, that's not good enough, brother. That's it. Um, Robert, since those students don't want to answer, can always take a shot. Um, well, at least one reason uh, why you need a progressive revelation is because, uh, for example, in 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 the law it says you can't marry your sister. Uh, if you did that right at the beginning, um, where did Cain get his wife? Can't get married. Yeah. Abraham, serious problems. So yeah. uh, if you don't slowly progress the revelation on, plus there's context to the revelation that sure. comes from what happened before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if it hasn't happened yet, it makes no sense. Sure. Yeah, so what you're saying is that history moves. Yes. And so as history moves, God needs to reveal what is appropriate for that time and that yes. period, what is necessary for them to know about his will, his law, or his nature. So um, as Genesis progresses, you find that God permits intermarrying between uh, family members. But when you get to Exodus and Leviticus, it is prohibited. Different era, different um, uh, um, um, ways in which God deals with man. So I think the purposes are there. It's harder to find. You're right. It is harder to find. But every writer has a purpose. And God is the ultimate author. So he's got a reason why that book is written. Uh, there's a there's a hand, and then that's our last comment. Matt. On the map that you had up early on, you mentioned um, the three areas. That's the one. On yes. the right, the arrows on the right. Is that not Asia? You mentioned Europe. Yeah, so, um, oh, yeah, Europe. Europe is on your left. Over there. Top. Um, this so, the, is the, 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 where, where you got the arrows, is that not Asia, coming from Asia? Um, no, this Middle East. No, but it's still you Middle mentioned East. Europe, so yeah. Sorry, I, uh, I'm. Th that's probably clo Turkey's pro probably closer to to Europe than. But the direction those arrows are coming from, that's Europe is that side, is not. I'm no, sorry, Asia. No, 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 no. That's um, still it's still Middle Middle East, if I if I'm correct. Yeah, the left, the left Over is there, Europe. Yeah, Europe is not on that side, on the right hand side. Um, did you, is that all you wanted to, <laughs> okay, last comment, that's not Europe, so um, what, what I, yeah, I should have probably said if you wanted to come from Europe that way, you, you still had to pass um, that area if you were making war with the Egyptians, um, but anyway, uh, point taken, that's not Europe, thank you. Anyway, um, we'll do Genesis next time, so I'll start with the outline. And we'll work our way through the book of Genesis. So we'll be a week behind, but we'll make it up somewhere. Okay. We can take, uh, we'll take five minutes. Uh, I have a short sermon today.